Welcome everyone. Today I'm speaking with Harrison Gable and Benyam Kinde from uh, Michael Greenberg's lab um, at Harvard University. Harrison is a postdoc post and Benyam is an MD, PhD student. And we're going to be speaking with them about a paper that was just published in Nature. They're going to help us understand it. So welcome Harrison, Benyam, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. So we're going to jump right in, um, and we're going to ask you to explain what is a long gene, because basically your paper says that MECP2 regulates long genes. And so the first question that people are going to have is, what is a long gene? Sure. So in, the, in your genome, you have a long stretch of DNA, and that encodes all the building blocks that go into your cells. And uh, genes are the units, the individual building blocks. So uh, a long gene is a gene that takes up a very large, long stretch of DNA in your genome. And when your cells try to make that gene, they have to transcribe or make a very, very, very long product. And so long genes, as we're looking at them in our, in our study, are a, sort of the top 10% longest, longest genes in the genome, the top 10% of those. And uh, the cell has to probably do a number of very important things to try to produce, or to try to make those uh, long genes work. Okay. So, so in neurons, those are particularly important. Great. So the body has short genes and medium genes and long genes. Functionally, why does that happen? What's the difference between these different length genes? So something that uh, was a really interesting finding from our uh, from our paper is that we find that long genes tend to be expressed at a much higher level in the brain relative to other tissues and parts of the body. Um, so it turns out that the brain uh, uh, uses long genes almost exclusive, exclusively relative to other parts of the body. Yeah, so perhaps, you know, if, if your liver cells use, they use mostly the medium-sized genes and the shorter genes, and the brain is using these long genes much more so than your liver cells. And that might be why you need MECP2, the protein that's disrupted in Rett syndrome, to help turn these genes on and regulate them. And then when you lose the lose MECP2, why the brain is particularly affected. Is it correct to say that longer genes are more complex genes? It, it, from a per, first approximation, yeah, it would be it would be correct to say that a long gene is often going to, to encode a more complex, more multifunctional um, component of the cell, and, nerve, and the nervous system needs to do a number of very complicated uh, jobs. So neurons need to, to uh, carry electrical signals between each other, and this requires a very specialized apparatus. And we think that the longer genes, or that we can see when we look at the function of these genes, that they're really important for these complex functions. And okay. so that, when thinking about why you need these long genes, yeah, it's a very good explanation and why they're so important to the nervous system. Okay, that, that makes intuitive sense, I think. So, as you can imagine, uh, parents and family members of, uh, of um, children with Rett syndrome are going to want to know the clinical relevance of, of your findings. And in fact, there is clinical relevance because there is a class of drugs that can bring down. Um, expression level of long genes. So if you could talk to us briefly about that and tell us kind of where you are in the process and, and what, what the clinical relevance you think might be. Absolutely. So in, in, the ret, in the brain of someone with Rett syndrome, we believe that these long genes are being made too much. And um, so if you could think of a way to try to rebalance how much of these long genes are being produced, that would be, of course, a approach to trying to treat the disease. And what's very exciting is that uh, some studies done by Ben Philpott and Mark Zilka's laboratory recently showed that there's a class of drugs, as you mentioned, uh, topoisomerase inhibitors, that will specifically bring down how much, long, how much the long genes are being produced. So we have a, a drug now that can perhaps correct some of the, the, the too much, uh, the overexpression, we like to say, of long genes in the brain. So now we're starting to get into... In the, in the study we just published, we did a first experiment to see if it would be possible to use these drugs with neurons to bring down this overproduction of, of long genes. 
And those experiments work as sort of a first test. Of course, there's many steps in front of us, one of which is to just do a test in mice and see if we can actually have an effect of improving some of the neurological dysfunction in the mice that model Rett syndrome. Of course, there's some challenges here as well. This drug allows us to do an experiment and to work towards seeing if this is a therapy, therapy that we can uh, use, but it's also a, currently used to treat cancer and has a number of very severe toxicity effects. So it might not be the, and likely is not the, the last um, drug that you would use to treat the disease, but it gives us a very uh, encouraging step forward in terms of, of coming up with strategies to, to uh, treat the disease. And we're very excited about trying this in mice, and then the process of trying to find a, a drug that might be less toxic but have similar effects on the expression of long genes would, of course, be what we would, would pursue in the future. And we think, we think conceptually that our study might provide an important new avenue to test along these lines. And to that end, uh, through the MECB2 consortium that we're a part of, uh, we've been put in contact with uh, a company that is on their way to developing perhaps a less toxic version of this drug that will also be testing uh, in animal models uh, of red syndrome. Yeah, that's an example. Um, as you know, Monica, because you, you helped us uh, find the company that's, that's, that's helping us with this drug, an example of how being really engaged in the RET research community and how this consortium that was put together by RSRT and funded is really helping us uh, make connections in science that, that will help us step forward in terms of thinking about therapeutics. Great, great. Well, I want to thank you for um, helping explain to families um, the, the significance and the implications of your work. And I'm sure that um, everyone listening joins me in wishing you the very best of luck as you move this research forward. We're anxious to hear what happens um, with, the, with the mouse work and see if we get any improvements in symptoms. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your interest in RET. And um, we can't wait to hear more. Thank you, Monica. Thank you.